I've managed to get hold of some F1 brakes and I'm going to explain exactly how they work. These things are absolutely incredible. They stop an F1 car from 200 miles an hour down to zero in less than four seconds and due to the deceleration can cause a driver's head and helmet to weigh over 55 kilos. I'm Scott Mansell from Driver61 where we train racing drivers to fulfill their potential. Now first up I'm going to jump in and explain what each of these pieces actually does in the braking system as a whole before going through them in a bit more detail. So the one piece that I'm missing here is the F1 pedal. If you imagine the F1 pedal at the, the start of the sequence here, the driver presses the brake pedal, it then pushes these pistons inside the master cylinders which pushes hydraulic fluid through these nozzles, through some brake pipe, into the caliper here. Now in the caliper here, there's some pistons in the back, which we'll go into more detail later on, which push themselves out when the driver gets on the pedal. Then these in turn put force on the brake pads, which clamp together around the brake disc as we see here and then that deceleration load is transferred through the wheel and the tyre into the track causing the car to decelerate. So let's start off with the master cylinders here. Now as you'll notice there's two master cylinders. One is actually for the front braking system and one is for the rear. The rear nowadays is helped by the MG UK which I'll go into a bit more detail a little bit later on. So we've got the shaft here which is connected to uh, a piston inside and you can see that we can push the shaft and this is when you get on the brake pedal that's what actually compresses inside there. So inside the chamber here we've got the piston and a seal which moves hydraulic fluid um, down the chamber and up through the fitting here into the brake pipe. This little nozzle connects to the braking reservoir which holds all of the braking fluid. The reason that you need a reservoir is for when the brake pads are wearing throughout a race, obviously the pad material is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and so the pistons will move further and further out and we need to fill that space with fluid. If you imagine the inside um, of the master cylinder here, we've got the shaft, there's a piston in here, and just in this area here, there's actually a little hole that allows the fluid to come in. So when you first get on the brakes and press the pedal, the piston inside here will cover up the little hole, which then makes the rest of the system a closed circuit. As I mentioned before, we've got two master cylinders here. Um, and you can see that they can, they, can, they can float around like this. Now the reason that they do that is so that the driver can change the brake balance or the brake bias. The brake bias is the difference in braking force from the front to the rear of the car. Typically a Formula 1 car, because of its weight distribution, will run maybe 55% of the braking force through the front axle and 45% at the rear. So mechanically, this can be done with this part of the braking system, which is basically a pivot. Let me just take it apart. And you can see here that there's a screw thread um, on the bottom. So as a driver screws it one way or the other way, it transfers braking force from the front to the rear and they can find that perfect spot. Now this is done with an electronic motor nowadays but it used to just be done with uh, a screw fixing on the driver's dashboard but it's essentially the same system. We're just shifting um, or changing the leverage from one side to the other to move more of that force to the front or the rear of the car. In fact nowadays you can see drivers changing the braking bias between corners on the steering wheel. They'll flick a little rotary dial and it will move that braking balance forward and back. And you may be asking yourself why would a driver need to do this between corners on the same track? Well each corner will have a slightly different characteristic. Maybe it's a slightly different service, maybe it's got some gradient or some camber and therefore the braking balance will need to be slightly different. So once we've moved the piston in the master cylinder, the fluid comes out the top here and will move down a braking pipe. Now there's not much to say about the braking pipes. They're steel braided and they have a rubber liner on the inside. The fluid moves down the brake pipe and then comes into the caliper 
just through this one hole here. Now you may see on a road car that the caliper is mounted uh, on the horizontal here, but on an F1 car it's around the disc somewhere towards the bottom, but rarely at the bottom. Now the reason that they do that is to keep the center of gravity as low as possible. That means that the, essentially the car can go around the corner a fraction quicker. The reason that the caliper's not sat at the bottom here is because at the top of the caliper just here, you can see that there's some kind of nut. Now this is in fact a bleed nipple. The F1 braking system uses hydraulic fluid, which doesn't compress. However, if any air gets in the system, which it can do now and then, it can give a spongy, squashy feeling to the brake pedal because it's possible to compress air. Now, drivers don't want this. It makes it more difficult to be accurate and it just gives a horrible feeling in the pedal. So in between sessions, the team will actually bleed the brakes. And that means that we're flushing through the fluid to push the air out. And this bleed nipple is where they open the system to allow the fluid to come through and so the air as well. Therefore, these bleed nipples need to be at the top of the caliper so that the air can come out. So when you're looking at the caliper, you'll notice that the pistons, they're actually different sizes. The diameter of these pistons, the six of them, get bigger as you go around the caliper, up to the top of the caliper. Now, why is that? It may seem strange that they're applying different forces to the back of the pad. Well, the reason is because the disc is spinning inside the caliper here, if the pistons were all exactly the same size, the first ones that are in contact with the rotational force of the disc would actually cause that part of the pad to wear more. So actually, if you think of the disc rotating, we need less pressure on the first part of the pad, just here, and a little bit more as it goes around. So next up, we have the disc and the pad. Now this is where things get really interesting from the material point of view. So the pads just actually just slide in the caliper like this. And you can see there that they just fit in, they're just floating, there's nothing else holding them in. So the idea is that the, the, the pistons at the back will push on the, on the pads here, they'll move inside and create friction on the disc itself. The pads and the disc are made from a composite material called carbon carbon, which is a bit of a strange name, but it's two types of carbon used together to create an incredibly strong heat resistant material. The disc has a maximum diameter of 270 millimeters and a maximum thickness of 32 millimeters. Each one of these weighs less than 1.5 kilos, which is incredible considering the force that goes through them. The way that the brakes work is that it turns kinetic energy of the car moving along into heat energy by the fact that the pads here are creating friction on the disc. And because of all the forces and speed involved in Formula One, these brakes have to work in an absolutely huge temperature range. So the temperature of the disc and the pads can get up to and over 100 degrees Celsius, which is why in some photos and on some video, you can see the, the disc actually glowing when the driver's really hard on the brakes. There's actually a lot of skill involved in managing the temperature of the brakes so that they're always working at their optimum, both from the driver and the team. So when the brakes are too cold, there's not enough friction when the driver gets on the brakes. But as the driver brakes and the discs are rotating, they're actually heating up. So you imagine from the driver's perspective, you get on the brakes and they're not working particularly well. And then two tenths, three tenths of a second later, they really start to grab. So this is why you can, at the start of a race, sometimes see drivers locking up quite easily because the brake temperature has got too cold. If you've made it this far through the video, I'd just like to take five seconds to ask you to subscribe to the Driver61 channel. I'm going to be working my way through our entire Formula One car, explaining how all of the bits work. So make sure you subscribe and click that bell icon. So the F1 braking discs are ventilated, so they've got these holes in them. Now this disc is a few years old, um, but the modern discs have many, many more holes in them than, than this one, which allows more surface area so that the brakes can cool more easily. 
but essentially what happens is the ducting brings the, the cool air in, it brings it in through the middle of the disc here and it dissipates out through the outside, through the holes on the outside, cooling it as it goes. Now, as with many things in Formula One, it's always a compromise. The bigger duct that you have, the more it's going to disrupt the airflow over the rest of the car. And you know how important aerodynamics are in F1. And as we hear in F1 quite a lot nowadays, this is quite a difficult thing to manage. The difficulty comes at circuits such as Baku, where there's a long, tight and twisty section with low average speed, followed by really fast sections without much braking. That's why we commonly see braking mistakes going into turn one at Baku. Next up, we have the brake bell, and this is connected to the, the disc with these sliders just here. Now, the reason that it's essentially floating is because the aluminium braking bell and the carbon disc expand with heat at slightly different rates. These nuts here just hold the bell onto the disc all the way through here, as you can see. Modern F1 cars don't actually use this braking bell anymore and the disc actually just fits directly onto the stub axle. Once the disc is connected to the stub axle, the wheel then goes on the outside with the wheel nuts and the braking system is complete. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other F1 engineering videos by clicking the link just up here. And if you're a driver yourself and you wanna understand how you can be faster on track and fulfill your potential, then click on the playlist just down here and I'll catch you in the next video.